Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. Not a lot of people are here yet, but we're going to begin the study and um, continue looking at Daniel 11, verse 15. Before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? The dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for what you have been showing us in your word, and so we are thankful that we can come together to open your word and to receive more light. And we just pray that you can be with each person who is studying and be with us in this study. Help us, Lord, to see your love, your forgiveness, your mercy, and your power. And may it be exercised in our lives. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. Hi, Dwight. Uh, good morning. So, um, <clears throat> so we were looking yesterday at uh, the last thing we really looked at was adding uh, these numbers together, the 1992. Um, this is this phrase. Um, and in those times during the Fifth Syrian War, there shall many. Okay, so this is um, this is what we've been doing with these numbers. We've been adding them together, and we find spans of time. This span of time is um, 718 days past April 5th, 2030, if we start on November 9th, uh, 2019, or, yeah, or 1989, pardon me. So that period of time from November 9th, 1989 is 14,575 days. Um, and that we found by taking um, 6256 in Daniel 11.6 and um, adding it to uh, H 8141. So this was this... Um, a period of 22 years and 105 days. And then we took the symbol by multiplying 6 times 2 times 5 times 6 of 360 and adding it to there. So we get November 9th, 1989 to April 5th, 2030. So this symbol brings us to April 5th, 2030, and then a July 18 symbol of days passed it. So you say it's interesting. Um, and note should mention uh, Capricar for seven one seven four six. So um, okay, so you're you're saying that I should mention what what's exactly that am I supposed to do there around saying that there's one seven four six somewhere. Yeah, that that's I'm, just the numbers for uh, the four digit Capricar X constant. But where are they? Where, where am I supposed to mention them? Um, the 17 years and 46 days. Ah, right. That's it. Um, so 17 years and 46 days. Is constant one seven six four, right? So it's just got that, it's got the digits of it, just not in the same order. Is that correct? Or am I, yeah, basically, yeah. And of course, one of the significance of the, that constant, right, is if you take, um. You know, it, it relates to all kinds of things. But anyway, I'll just, I'll put it in there just as a note. Um, and, uh, but anyway, getting back to this, this symbol that connects us to April 5th, 2030, what, and what we're suggesting is that this, this global event is connected symbolically to that date. So we're not saying that April 5th, 2030 is 
you know, Padiam or the Sunday law or anything like that. It's just that it is a symbolic date that shows that there's an extension of time. It illustrates that our line is not the completion of, you know, Jeff's line. Like we're not going to have the Sunday law completing Jeff's line because we don't have midnight in the midnight cry yet. Now, um, there was uh, a bit of a discussion in um, on Facebook. I'm trying to remember which Facebook page it was. Um, don't know where this was. I mean, I'm looking at the file, but I'm not sure. Um, but there was this discussion, a guy named Zambi Kumbinwa, who I've had discussions with before. He'll never really tell me anything about himself, which makes me suspicious of people. But anyway, um, uh, he got in a discussion with Pat Rampey. Um, and this is dealing with uh, Jeff's article, uh, number Revelation of Jesus Christ, number 18. So this was the mark article from uh, yesterday, right? So uh, that's November 19th. And so they were having a discussion about this article, uh, which I haven't uh, read all the way through yet. Um, but in the the heading where this article is posted, that Pat post, posts it, it says, those of us who participated in the national prediction must repent of that sin and pray the prayer of confession of Daniel if we want to be included in the Lord's future plans. Now, um, did anybody read that article of Jess from yesterday's? I started to read it, and I saw Pat Rampey's comment on Facebook. Okay. Um, so, um, so it says here in this article, is the opening up of the hidden mystery history of the seven thunders and the opening of the seventh seal actually uh, two witnesses that identify that the revelation of Jesus Christ is now being unsealed. If it is, is it actually true that the entire book of Revelation is speaking of the last days? If that is true, and does the three and a half days represent the tearing time in the virgin's parable? If it does, then does the remedy of the seven times actually represent a command that must be met by those who participated in the Nashville prediction of July 18, 2020? Wow, there is a test for you. Do those that wake up and realize they are in the tearing time actually have to repent for their sins and their father's sins at the end of the three and a half days? Was it really a sin to disregard the command not to employ time in a prediction? Now, that is, I mean, there's so many little things tied to that. And I'm, I'm bringing it up um, for a number of reasons, having to do with these lines and understanding where we're at in a line. So um, he says then, for those who took the position that the failed prediction of Nashville was somehow God's intended purpose and who thereafter have attempted to uphold that claim, I would add another observation. Beyond the sin of employing time in God's prophecies, what happened with the false prediction of Nashville was not simply a manifestation of rebellion to Christ's command in 1844. It was an action that told those outside of Adventism that the predictions found in the spirit of prophecy are faulty. It was a reproach upon the writings of the spirit of prophecy. It provides evidence for those in the world that the writings of Ellen White are important as the writings of Joseph Smith or of Nostradamus. Now, if you think about this, and we place this with the Millerites in 1844, Were the Millerites supposed to set time? Could could they support the Bible with the idea that they could know the day and hour of Christ's return? No, they, they could not. They could not, but they did. Were they to repent of that sin after October 22, 1844? No. No. Because God had led them, right? Correct. Jeff continues to act like Miller after October 22, 1844. Right. I'm not saying that Jeff's going to be lost because I don't believe Miller's going to be lost and I, I don't believe Jeff is going to be. So 
But we look at this problem here that people, and Jeff here is not realizing what he is saying. Because even though we can say, well, you know, Christ moved from the holy to, holy to the most holy place in a, October 22, 1844, so the Millerites weren't wrong. Well, they were wrong. We know that they they were wrong uh, about the earth being the sanctuary, but they were correct as to the time, right? They were wrong about the event that was to occur on October 22, 1844, but they were correct as to the time. Now, when it comes to repenting of the sin of time setting, if, if we have to do that, the Millerites would have to do it too, for exactly the same reason that Jeff is stating here. Because did it not weaken uh, the people's belief in the Bible when this prediction failed? Yes. Right? So an, an Adventism, uh, you know, their prediction is a shibboleth of... Um, you know, this, this thing, and, and it, and it, you know, there's lots of different illustrations. It could be the albatross that hangs around their neck, whatever you want to say. Um, but the, the great disappointment is looked down upon by people outside in the world, by other churches, and even within Adventism itself. So that's not an argument against God leading the Advent movement. And so to employ this type of argument that Jeff is using here, is extremely dangerous because uh, the sword cuts both ways. Right? Correct. Okay. <clears throat> so, so we need to recognize that we made a mistake, but that st- mistake was still in God's providence because God, because we were paralleling Millerite history. Now, um, I'll I'll go to my Facebook page here. So this is the comments and everything on there. So I said, Jeff is fulfilling the role of Miller after October 22, 1844. Miller recanted. To recant would be a denial of the Lord's leading. I do not believe Jeff will be lost. He is being misled by those around him. And then uh, Zambi Kumbinwa says, uh, in what way is he being misled by those around him? Ooh. And he cannot and he cannot be fulfilling Miller after 1844, which was after the third angel entered in. And we haven't even finished our second angel. Your typology is. Now, I bring this up, the, this comment here, because um, what is he missing? So he's saying, well, if we're following Millerite history, and we and the third angel hasn't entered, you know, whatever that means here, because we know that the second angel um, has arrived. And so we're going to parallel it with Millerite history. But he says, well, you, you know, you can't have Jeff fulfilling Miller if we're still in the second angel's message. Right. So what is his problem here? What is he missing? Because this could be a good argument if we understood the lines the way that we understood the lines, you know, three or four years ago. Right? Okay. Now, I'm looking at when I looked at this, and I'm yeah. considering it at this point. This Kumbiwa is failing to recognize that while the third angel had arrived, it had not been formalized or empowered in 1844. Correct. And and we are we are repeating Millerite history to lead to finally its empowerment. That is, our history is not on the line of Ellen White. Our history is a zoom into the Sunday law. Right. So if we don't understand the role of our history and how we're paralleling Millerite history, then we can't fully appreciate where we are in the lines. So 
if if he's arguing that we have to wait till after the close of probation for nothing to happen and then Miller Miller's uh to uh Miller being typified by Jeff is going to happen after the close of probation right because that's why it parallels right or after the Sunday law right so we have to have a disappointment in our history and that disappointment needs to parallel the Millerite disappointment and we've done that in a in a typical line right so i don't know how much zambi kumbimwa has followed anything that we've done um you know since july 18th um and all the studies that we've done and how we've understood these lines and how we can zoom into a waymark and get a new line and that we understand that our line is a typical line that is our line is really Samuel Snow's letters uh where Samuel Snow this movement is Samuel Snow and acting as Samuel Snow but we still can have Jeff acting as Miller after the disappointment because we had a disappointment because Jeff is paralleling of the July 18 disappointment to the first disappointment right so what he's done is he's moved it from July, you know, he's he's got rid of the first disappointment as being November 9th, right? He's going to say July 18th is that disappointment. That's the first disappointment. And so now this is Miller after April 19th. Does Miller after April 19th um, then continue on? I mean, he, he accepts reluctantly um, Snow's interpretation. So I, I just don't see where the parallel could be in how Jeff is applying it. Um, there's just no consistency, right, in this. So what we are saying is that we are in a line that's typical. We don't believe in time setting. You know, you can say we've repented of time setting. That is, we recognize by what happened that we can't predict events in advance. We can't predict the timing of events. We can only uh, watch and wait. And watching and waiting includes rec recognizing chronological structures and even dates in the future. But those dates themselves cannot be a prediction of events. So to say that we have to repent of, you know, time setting, uh, to me, is kind of a remarkable claim, so that we have to repent, and that the, somehow we can take uh, that we can take this and not recognize that it, it would be just as much a witness against Millerite history as our own, because the Millerites really were not to time set. If if you take Christ's words, it's not for you to know the day or the hour of when He's going to return, and they applied these prophecies. They applied the time correctly, but not the event. And so they should have known that. They didn't. They don't need to repent of it. Okay. So this is, um, you know, something that we have been grappling with this whole time since July 18, 2012. So when we look at, at these lines here and we start talking about the future, I mean, we can't know the day or the hour. We can put a date, April 5th, 2030, but we have to recognize that as a symbolic date. Maybe something happens on that date. Maybe something doesn't. But we're not predicting anything on any specific date. Now, the other thing is we know that Jeff is predicting that Trump is going to be uh, reelected. Right. Or maybe not reelected, become president. Again, right. Now that, that puts a type of time restraint, not on the second coming, of course. But to me, it doesn't really make much of a difference if you're giving like a symbolic date, like April 5th, 2030. And you're saying, well, certain things have to happen within this time that God has given us. And it's a symbolic time. We don't know what that means yet. Um, 
But, you know, you're sort of, as Jeff is doing, saying, well, we can't time set, but Trump is going to be president again. I, I don't see how we can make those types of claims and yet single out time setting as the thing we need to repent of. There are lots of things we need to repent of. One is listening to rumors and gossip about individuals. That's one thing, right? We know that we can't do that. We can't just use rumors and gossip to attack an individual. Or really, to attack what the individual is saying. Right? Instead of addressing the points, you shut the person out. So one of the problems that we have with Jeff right now, and maybe that will change, but we have no way of communicating that. <clears throat> He's not interested in, in any kind of discussion about any of these things, and that's not a good thing. Right? He's basically just saying, here is what I'm presenting. I'm not taking any input from anyone, and you just have to accept it, even though there's all kinds of problems with it. Even though it contradicts those things I've said in the past, even though my presentation is internally inconsistent and contradictory, you need to accept it. So that would be a problem, right? Okay, so getting back to this then, we can see that we have this symbol of Paneum and the aftermath, which leads to the Sunday Law. But we can't really predict anything from it. We, we have some general ideas. We know that um, there's a conflict between two ideologies with another ideology, if you want to call it papacy and ideology, um, uh, watching from the sidelines, trying to manipulate and control the outcome to put itself in the best place so that it can clean up the mess, so to speak. Right? That's what we understand is happening. Correct. In colloquial terms, that's that's what's happening. So, so how that's exactly going to unfold, we don't know. But we do know that it is a conflict in which uh, this atheistic communism has its day. Um, to some degree. Right. I mean, we know it's going to uh, fail in whatever it's trying to do. So how far it goes. Um, but it has some kind of victory. Um, you know, and, and somebody could argue, well, maybe the pandemic was that. Right. It, uh, you know, it had its day and 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 that's occurred. So, so on an international uh, level. Right. It's been seen as foolish. And now we're going to see. Uh, the backlash to that. And, and so on an international level, we're going to see uh, the United States then come in with a Republican government and and dominate world politics and, and bring about a Sunday law. And so that is possible. So I'm not discounting that possibility. Um, but I would think that it needs to be a bit more than that. I think that the WEF needs to have its agenda pushed farther than what we've seen. And based upon how we've looked at these lines, it appears to be that way, that we've basically had mostly this struggle between the Republicans and the Democrats in the USA, between the King of the North and the King of the South in the U.S. Um, and uh, that the King of the South, as far as this ideology is concerned is is still building may not feel that way you know if you're you know watching youtube and so forth but if you're watching the main news you don't see um atheistic communism faltering it appears to be winning right obviously the alternative news sites are trying to give us hope you know that everything's the tide is going to change and, and in Canada, you know, it looks like we'll get uh, Trudeau overthrown 
you know, in, in a few months from now, but it's not really going to change the, the grassroots that there still is the majority of support for left leaning, uh, ideologies and, and that those will probably continue, but we don't know. You know, I could be wrong about that. So when we get to verse 15, though, we see this, um, what happens after the battle of the Neum. And um, so I put lose the battle of Paneum, not not with with not withstand. I mean, so the battle of Paneum has already happened in verse thirteen, um, and then we're going to see uh, what happens. Like it, at least it talks about it, the the preparation for it. And I would think that this is connected with with the battle of Paneum, verse fifteen, and its aftermath. But uh, maybe maybe it's not quite in order. Maybe there's something that I'm missing. Okay, so hopefully that's that's going to be. Uh, is there any questions about what we're looking at in verse 15 and how we're understanding this? So when you say the king of the north, Antiochus the third, the USA shall come. We're saying circa 200 BC. So this is the Battle of Neum. Um, and we're, we're equating that with April 5th, 2030. And that's because, partly because of the symbols, but also, um, we're looking at it something in the future. There's going to be a raffia and a pineum. And cast up a mount and take the most fenced cities. Now, when you were dealing with casting up a mount, Dwight, what was your point about that? Because we don't have anything in there to explain what that means. We know it's a siege. But we were trying to put dealing with something about the Constitution. Right. What I was what I was trying to point out is in this casting up amount, we're generally understanding that this would be where a city comes under siege, where there a city is under attack. So the question is, is the Constitution a representation of a city because isn't a a city in prophecy something similar to a government okay so yeah so we're not going to take this as a literal siege i mean we we could say you know maybe this had something to do with you know the siege of washington dc or something like that but, um, you know, I don't, I don't think I can make that application here. I don't think it fits. Um, because we, one is we put that as the Battle of Raffia, not the Battle of Neum. Um, but we're saying a siege. So we're saying a siege and a siege then is symbolizing, uh, how would we put that in our time? If we're going to say that there's going to cast up a mount or a siege. Because we're going to have the most fenced cities. So, um, I mean, are we just going to put there the Constitution is under siege in some way? And how is that that it's happening? Well, if, if we look at, at what's going on right now, within the government, the Constitution is definitely under siege. Okay, so how particularly is that it under siege? How would we describe that? Because this is the king of the north coming, casting up a mount, and and so we would have to say that something within the U.S. itself... um, The king of the north coming in to cast up a siege or cast up a mount is to come against the king of the south. Right. So he's coming against the king of the south. You're saying it's a siege dealing with the Constitution. So if the Constitution has been under siege by the king of the south, wouldn't the king of the north come to tr- attempt 
in a a different way to try to reestablish. Okay. Well, I know what you're saying, though. If we're saying that it's and they're going to take the most fenced cities, so this is is Judah, which is going to be conquered, and, and the fenced city there is Sidon. So the significance of of Sidon um, as a symbol. Uh, what is it a symbol of? You know, but is this, is this Sidon or is this Zidon? And maybe I'm maybe I'm cutting hairs. It's Sidon. It's just the same same word. Just spelling in English. So um, at least that's that's my understanding. So um, okay, well let's. So one is. We don't have the word there in the verse, right? We're just we're just saying that that's what it's referring to. But but this is the city of Sidon, right? You have Tyre and Sidon. Okay. Okay. So those are coastal cities, right? All right. What's the symbol of Tyre and Sidon? The cities of Phoenicia, right? Okay, so let's uh, let's try this here. Because we also have Tyre. So what is Tyre as a symbol? I don't recall. Well, Tyre represents uh, the papacy, right? During the the 70 years, the days of one king, Tyre is going to be forgotten for 70 years. The days of one king. Correct? Okay, agreed. Okay. So, So Tyre represents the papacy in that context. Um, so, so here it says, woe unto the Chorazin. Now, I'm not sure what Chorazin is. Um, place in Palestine, what place? Um, a town in Galilee. Okay. So, woe unto the Chorazin, woe unto the Bethsaida, right? So these are places in the, that that's by the Lake Gennesaret, uh, either a small fishing village there um, or a village in Lower Galantis in the East. Anyway, it's it's areas in Palestine. Um, and it says, for if the mighty works had been done in Tyre and Sidon, which had been done in you, they had a great while ago repented, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. So we can say Tyre represents the papacy, but who does Sidon represent? It's 20 miles north of Tyre. Are they just a pair representing the same thing? Could it represent paganism or, you know, the, the spiritualism? Okay. So if we look at this and we say, well, this siege that happens after the Battle of Paneum is the king of the north coming against uh, Sidon. But Sidon is a city in Judah, right? Now, this is the king of the north. So we have all these symbols. We have the king of the north, Antiochus III. He represents the United States, right? The king of the north is uh, the United States. That's what we're saying. Unless we're going to try to narrow it down to, to something else. Because the United States is pretty broad. You know, it's apostate Protestantism. It's apostate Republicanism. But they're going to come in this time dealing with the Battle of Paneum, right? And in connection with that, uh, they're going to cast up a mount. They're going to have a siege. And they're going to take the most fenced cities. And according to Uriah Smith, this is referring to the siege of Sidon. 
and the arms of the south, the Egyptian army under Ptolemy V, shall not withstand. They're going to lose the Battle of Paneum and all of this stuff that happens afterwards. Neither his, that's Rome's chosen people, according uh, to Stephen, he's saying that neither his chosen people is not referring to God's people, but to the people that's, that Rome has chosen, which is Scopius and others, or Scopus and others. And neither shall there be any strength to withstand. That is, Seleucid Syria would dominate the Pal Palestine and Judea under Antiochus III. So that's how we're coming. I should switch screens. So that's how we're coming to understand this. So if we're saying that this is Sidon, uh, now, and we're saying that Tyre, Tyre, uh, Tyre represents the papacy, but this is the king of the south that is is being conquered, but the king of the south is being pushed out of the land of Palestine, right? That's what's happening with the Battle of Paneum. So the king of the north is taking a territory that it previously held. It's recovering it. Okay. So what would Sidon represent? Now we know that with Tyre it represents the papacy, but it represents the papacy as far as it's going to sing as a harlot at the end, right? Because uh, the Neo-Babylonian Empire is going to dominate uh, the Levant, right? So Palestine, the Middle East, going to dominate it for 70 years. And at the end of the 70 years, Tyre will be able to sing as a harlot. That is, it's going to be back selling its wares, right? And so we liken that to the papacy at the end of the time of the United States. The United States is, um, you know, the, it's the days of one king, refers to this period of the U.S., but it represents, it represents Babylon as well, right? But at the end of that 70 years for Babylon, Tyre sings as a harlot. So we make the parallel there with, with the United States. And if that interpretation is correct, how would we then see uh, Sidon? Because it's paired with Tyre. So it's going to be retaken by the king of the north. This is a fence city. It's, 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 a, it's a, de a defense. It's an important military site. So can we place this to some specific prophetic events that we're looking forward into the future? And can we look at uh, the city of Judah, Sidon? So the most famous cities of Judah, that's, those are going to be reclaimed. And maybe we should actually say Judea, to be more specific. <laughs> So the king of the south is being pushed out of this land that the king of the north occupied. The king of the south came in, right, in the Battle of Raphia, and now it's going to be claimed once again. So what does Sidon represent? Okay, people need to. Not ignoring thinking. Yes, me too. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm just going to read a little bit here about science. Uh, so Sidon is, means fishing town, and it's Sidon or Zidon. It doesn't matter. 
Um, it was in Asher, an ancient mercantile city of Phoenicia in a narrow plain between Lebanon and the Mediterranean, where the mountains recede two miles from the sea, 20 miles north of Tyre, now Sidon. Now, Old Sidon stands in the northern slope of a promontory projecting a few hundred yards into the sea, thus having uh, a fine naturally formed harbor. The citadel occupies the hill behind on the south. Sidon is called the firstborn of Canaan, the great Sidon or the metropolis. And that's a Joshua 11, 8. We have the reference to Sidon, Zidon, same thing. Sidonians in the gener generic name of the Phoenicians are Canaanites, or is the generic name of the Phoenicians or Canaanites. Laish is said to be far from Zion, where it's tired, 20 miles nearer, would have been specified if it had been a city of leading importance. So in Homer's, it's Homer, Sidon is named, not Tyre. So Justin Martyr makes mention of it, Augustus, okay. Joel reproved Sidon and Tyre for selling children of Judah and Jerusalem to the Grecians and threatens them to, to, with a like fate, Judah selling their sons and daughters to the Sabians. So Ezekiel 28, uh, 22 to 24, threatens Sidon with pestilence and blood in her streets so that she shall be no more a pricking briar unto Israel. Jesus went once to the coasts of Tyre and Sidon. Now, I would think this reference in Ezekiel would be um, important um, because he's going to say it's a prophecy against Sidon. So let's take a look at that. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Sidon and prophesy against it. And thus said the Lord, Lord God, behold, I am against thee, O Sidon. And I will be glorified in the midst of thee, and they shall know that I am the Lord. And I shall have executed judgments in her and be sanctified in her. For I will send into her pestilence and blood in her streets, and the wounded shall be judged in the midst. In the midst of, by her sword upon her on every side, and they shall know that I am the Lord. And there shall be no more a pricking briar in the house of Israel nor any grieving thorn of all that are round about them, that despise them, and that shall know that I am the Lord. Okay, so what is this referring to? What is what is the problem with Sidon? As we're approaching this, as as you have stated a couple of times, <clears throat> this was a fishing village, right? Yeah. And the name is fishing, right? Yeah. What was the command that the Savior gave to the disciples? I will make the fishers of men. Correct. Yet, when we also take a look at the, the number that we've got here for Zidon. Yeah. Six times seven times two times one gives us what? Um, gives us 84. 84. Yeah. Now, well, the other thing about fishing is just, you know, we have the 153 fishes as a symbol, too. When Jesus asks, uh, you know, Peter, I think it is, to throw it at his net over on the other side of the boat, and they catch 153 fish. Right? Correct. So, so there's a symbol there. So Sidon must represent something, uh, I mean, some, some religious symbol, as Tyre does. Tyre represents the papacy. But Sidon would represent, it, it's, it's a part of, well, I mean, technically it's Phoenicia, 
but it's it's in that Levant section. And it's it's uh, in, at the time in Panium, it's an important mil military installation because of its ability uh, to to withstand sieges primarily, but also it's coastal, so it has uh, benefits there. So I don't know any any more thoughts about that. So we got this. Any other ideas? Still considering, still looking. Okay. Now, um, one of the other verses, I mean, we, we have several verses where Zidon or Sidon is mentioned. Yeah. <clears throat> because Zidon is one of the sons of Canaan. Yeah. Yet, the ultimate, the final verses that come on this would come out of the book of Zechariah. Zechariah 9. Mm -hmm. Now, when we're looking at Zechariah 9, we're getting the instruction of the burden of the Lord, the word of the Lord. And Zidon is mentioned in Zechariah 9, verse 2. Yet, within the spirit of prophecy... When we are, are taking a look at um, Manuscript 65 of 1912, okay. paragraph 4 tells us that the Jews were a proud people boasting of piety, of knowledge, of goodness, but revealing no fruit. If they had set before the world an example of fruit bearing in deeds of self-denial, goodness, mercy, and compassion, if they had shown a love for God, that integrity in his service by obeying all of his commandments, the world would have seen their light shining in good works, and many would have been converted. Many would have, been, would have glorified God for his great love and his rich blessings bestowed upon them through their knowledge of the only true God, and their faith in Jesus Christ. The darkness of the Gentile world was attributed to the neglect of the Jewish nation and is represented in the ninth chapter of Zechariah. So, is this Zidon a representation of the darkness that is within the apostate churches. Well, it has to be something like that. Right. So, so I would say that, you know, if you're going to have Tyre represent the papacy, Simon should represent apostate Protestantism. Okay. Not fit with what you're thinking. Well, <clears throat> it's not <clears throat> so much with what I'm thinking. It's what's presented within Spirit of Prophecy. Yes. So so the taking, so they lose the Battle of Pinin, that is the King of the South. But also they had conquered the Protestant churches. And that the Protestant churches will then be conquered by the King of the North. By this ideology of apostate Protestantism. So, so they're going to lose their allegiance to the spiritualism of the king of the south, atheism, you know, all the wokeism, all that kind of stuff. They're going to become more conservative. But that would be one of the things that leads ultimately to the Sunday law. I don't know. Is this obvious or... 
are we not on course here? Well, <clears throat> here again, looking at the numerical value of Sidon. In one way, we can look back at this and we see a symbol of one of the items from the 1843 chart and the 1844 and the 1850 chart, excuse me. Now, Zidon as a representation of the darkness that's within the world, prophetically joined with this with Tyre represents that which is within the entire world at this time. Mm -hmm. So if, if that is off course, then the spirit of prophecy is off course and scripture is off course. And that's a hard thing to have to think. Yeah. So, so I think that we can say that Zidon does represent the Protestant religions right correct okay so that that would be consistent with what we have been saying and uh, this would then if we're going to go back to our document that we're working on um, so we got so we're just going to say simply um, the apostate Protestant churches. But would those, <clears throat> would the apostate Protestant churches be part of Judea? Um, well, yes, this area, right? Because this this is, I um, mean, it's most fenced cities of Ju Judea, but only because Judea now encompasses Phoenicia which isn't really technically Judea, but, um, you know, I could say the Levant. Right. <clears throat> so we're just going to say it. I mean, is this still good enough? The apostate Protestant churches are probably not. Yeah, one said. So, so wokeism has had taken over them, right? And now they're going to be conquered again by the USA. So now, so Antiochus the third is the king of the north. Um, but maybe USA is just too broad of a term. So, so would it be conservative USA? Yeah, or maybe republicanism. Republicanism, okay. Just to... So in this case, it's republicanism, but of the U.S., right? Republicanism is going to lay siege, right? And so this siege would be represented by um, some kind of what? what? What What is the siege going to represent as an action that we could describe it as something in our time? Abandoning wokeism, abandoning the small people, <clears throat> Um, abandoning group rights, no, because that's that's what's going to lead to the Sunday Law. Group rights, yeah. yeah, just a different form of group rights, right? But, but I think this siege itself is 
it's an action that we need to, I mean, we're not going to just say it's abandoning something. It's putting under siege these apostate Protestant churches, right? It's, it's, and then it's going to take them. So there's some ways in which it lays siege to the Protestant churches and, and then conquers them. That's the way that I would try to, to understand this. But I, I don't know what action particularly that would be. Do they lay siege politically? Is that how they conquer these apostate Protestant churches? Is it some kind of uh, pressure, economic, social pressure? Is it propaganda? Right. So that's what I don't have an answer to. Why we have this this siege? <clears throat> now, what's the other thing about a mount? Because they're going to cast up a mount, right? And we we know, you know, this is part of the siege. But that that's the language that's used in scripture. They cast up a mount. Now, in this case, it's not not the word, you know, har that we would have like in Armageddon, right? Um, it's a different Hebrew word, mount, and it's uh, solela. It's a feminine form. The word. Uh, it's used passively, a military mound that is a rampart, right? So it's like a bank or a mound. So they're, they're building a rampart. Uh, the number is 5550. I don't know if that tells us anything. What, what does it tell us from the combination of Shafak with Solela. Okay, so casting up a mount. Are you saying adding the two together? Right. Okay, so well, we get one three seven six zero. If we did it in prophetic years, it's going to be thirty eight point two two prophetic years. Um, if we did it in less than thirty eight years so in regular years i don't have a good answer for this yet but that okay. would be because you know when you look up this this phrase of casting up yeah the word is also translated shedding as in the shedding of blood because this first occurs in genesis 9 6 yeah okay So how do we interrelate the casting up of a mount with the shedding of blood? So it would be a type of persecution. Correct. Okay. Yeah, so that to me would make the most sense. That's sort of where I was leaning anyway. So... If this is to represent a type of persecution, what would be the thought of who was to be persecuted under the republicanism? Or is this just to be a straight out rejection of what we've been seeing from Biden and the King of the South? Yeah, so. OK, so we got so we, we are saying that the Protestant churches are to, taken over by the Wokens. And in order to. To end that, um, 
it's described as this siege, which is the shedding of blood, persecution. Now, you're saying then, now why do you bring in Biden? The Egyptian army under Ptolemy V, hadn't we already made, I mean, we're, we're saying Ptolemy IV is Biden. Yeah. So this would, the Egyptian under army under Ptolemy V, would be uh, the Democrats, right? The Democratic Party, wouldn't it be Democrats? Well, not yeah. necessarily Biden himself as a person. Would it be that, or would it be the the Biden? Would be so, yeah. I mean, we could just say the left. I think the left would be the, the better way of looking at this. Okay. Um, there you go. The left. I can agree with that. Okay. So they shall not withstand. So they're going to lose this battle of Paneum. And it's not just the battle of Paneum, it's the whole aftermath. Right. right. Um. But we're just clump, lumping it in there with all those events that happened with Benin and what results from it. Um, so they lose the battle. They, they do not withstand. So in this history, um, uh, they lose this. Um, this this ideological battle. Right, of some planets badly spelled. So we're just saying it's an ideological battle that they lose. Okay. So when we deal with Rome, Rome, of course, is Rome, right? And this, in historically, that was pagan Rome, but we're going to place this as the papacy. Okay. So. So the papacy's chosen people, whoever those are, right? Paralleled with Scopus and others, okay? So this could be all kinds of people, people we don't know personally yet at this time. Um, but these would be, you know, symbolically, um, you know, we could just list off a bunch of names right now that we would look at as those of the radical left. Right. Okay. So, I mean, I mean, there's all kinds of names, right? You know, we could, you know, Klaus Schwab and, and so forth, right? But they may not even be around at this time, right? They may be out of the way already. Um, you know, I could put Justin Trudeau in there, whatever. You know, his goal is to be the head of the UN. Maybe he'll be the head of the UN sometime in the future. I don't know. But, um, so neither shall there be any strength to withstand. Now, that doesn't mean that they're completely defeated and gone, because we know that this group is going to be part of this threefold union. It's just that Seleucid Syria is dominating, you know, hollow Syria and Judea, right? The land of Palestine, Palestine and Judea, under Antiochus III. And so... So this is going to happen on a worldwide scale. But but here, this is particularly talking about this, this territory of the United States in some ways, but everything that the United States controls, right? So the United States comes in and dominates the churches. It dominates... Uh, the religion. So whatever the republicanism of the U.S. is, it's going to dominate this whole territory. So I don't know what we would describe that. Now, just as there should not be any strength to withstand, and we could just focus upon what it means that there isn't any strength to withstand, to withstand what? 
right? So we're just saying, well, because there was no strength to withstand, they dominated this whole reason. So this is Swearington's uh, language, though he's placing it in the time of his type, his epiphanies. But we can probably get rid of this. I just think that this is too much, too much information of what this verse says. So neither shall there be any strength to withstand. So what is this? To stand against what? Now, this word withstand, we've seen it before. It's 5975. It's stand up, right? Many shall stand up against the king of the south. So what is it that, that the king of the south now cannot do? There's no strength to withstand. This word strength, uh, koach, meaning to be firm, means vigor, literally force in a good or a bad sense, or figuratively. Capacity means produce, produce also from its hardiness, a large lizard, can refer to as it. Um, chameleon, force, fruits, might, power, strength, substance, wealth different ways that it's translated. So it's translated as chameleon, which is interesting. Um, and, and neither his chosen people. Now we're saying that this is the chosen people, at least this is the interpretation Stephen gave. It's the chosen people of Rome. Now that's not necessarily, just because Stephen said it, even though you know he's looked into these things, that is a view that's held by some, and Stephen's saying that view. Whether that's... Um, now, if we say his chosen people is referring to uh, God's people, that would be different than if we're saying the ones that Rome has chosen. Now, so this expression, um, it says select, that is best, choice, chosen. People, of course, is am, right? So, uh, so that refers to, uh, like, by people is ami, ami. So chosen here, uh, mib, mibchar, or mibchar, very strange word. Now it's from, so the number is 4005, but it's from 977. Now, is there any significance there that would allow us to say that this is not Rome's chosen people, but that this is God's chosen people. And if it's God's chosen people, that would obviously parallel the Seventh-day Adventist church. Right? So this word, uh, choicest, best, it's from 977, which means to select. What's the significance of 977 as a symbol? I'll switch the screen so you can see what I'm looking at. 977, what is it? So we have a number of symbols here that, that aren't evident. So the, it comes from 977. But the number, the Hebrew number here is 4005. And 4005 is three times 1335. Interesting. Now, now I often say, you know, that our symbols of the numbers don't derive our interpretation. But they definitely help in interpreting what we're looking at, making choices. Right. So it's not like we just use the numbers and then uh, just use those. We're, we're looking at a lot of things. Here. But we have 977. That's when the kingdom is divided. Right. To the north and the south. 977 B.C. That's Rehoboam and Jeroboam. OK. Right. So we have that symbol in the meaning of this word chosen. And the word chosen is three times it's 4,005, but it's three times 1335. 
But it's also interesting that this word, 4005, also occurs first in Genesis 23, 6. Okay, so this word, in 23, 6, Hear us, my Lord, thou art a mighty prince among us. In the choice of our our sepulchres, bury thy dead. None of us shall withhold from thee his sepulchre that thou mayest bury thy dead. Okay, so the significance there? No. Aren't these the sons of Heth that are coming before Abraham? Aren't they saying that he can choose any of these, any any portion of that land that is not his to bury his dead? Yeah. So that's, um, let's see. I mean, Ezekiel 24, 4, and 5 also has quite a bit to say about that, but it's still just, I, I'm just looking at first reference. Yeah. Okay. And, okay, I'm going to look at a couple of things here. So one is, I look at symbols of the verses that a word occurs in. Now we have, Jeremiah 22 and Isaiah 22, both verse 7, that contain this word. And this, this word only occurs 14 times in the Bible. Right. Right. Um, so I thought that's interesting, just that there's these two verses. Now, the one in Jeremiah says, I will prepare destroyers against thee, every one of his weapons, and they shall cut down thy choice cedars and cast them into the fire. And in Isaiah... Uh, 22, 7, and it shall come to pass that thy choicest valleys shall be full of chariots, and the horsemen shall set themselves in array at the gate. Um, so here the choicest has to do with what, um, you know, it's not like we wouldn't just say Daniel eleven fifteen is thy chosen people, right? You know, that, it, that we're just translating that. We're saying, well, that's Israel and God's chosen people. But we're looking at this word choicest, or choice, and and that's odd. Um, seeing why that is must be a typo because um, it has Isaiah twenty two verse seven. It says it's four zero five five, not four zero zero five, and I believe that's a completely different word. So it might be just be a typo. I'm just going to look that up. Yeah, so that's just a, a typo. So there's a little typo I found in the program. Okay. Okay, so so it is uh, 4005 there in Isaiah 22.7. Just somehow the, the verse itself has a typo next to it, 4055. I don't know how they did that. I've never made typos, so I don't know. Um, but anyway... When it comes to this uh, this chosen people, we can see that this is the choicest people. And and the question then is, the his is referring to who? Now, we could say it's the king of the south's chosen people, right? Scopus. Or, or we're going to say it's Rome's chosen people, right? Which, which really doesn't make sense as far as I'm concerned. I don't think it makes sense to, to say these are the people that Rome has chosen. That is, they're going to go all the way back to verse 14. The robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves um, or establish themselves, exalt themselves to establish the vision. They fall and saying that his chosen people, because the his is referring not to the robbers of thy people, it has to refer to something that can be his, and that would have to be the king of the north or the king of the south. So if we took this as the king of the north's chosen people, this would just be saying that they're going to conquer this area, but they're not going to have the strength to stand. Right? And, and then the chosen people, 
that, and I think part of the reason they're saying, well, who are these chosen people? Well, Scopus and all these other people have been chosen, but it has to be something different, right? So this is chosen people, the choicest people. And um, now when it says neither his choicest people, if we look at the Hebrew here, I'm just going to look at another translation. It says, nor the people of his choice in Young's literal translation. Um, um, and this one's going to say, or even his best troops, for there should be no strength to stand. So it's saying his best troops. Um, but if we look at uh, the Hebrew, what I want to see here is neither where it talks about neither his chosen people. And um, um, and what, or neither shall they stand. And that is what I thought. It's the, um, so kind of translate this literally. Um So, so the arm of the south, and then it's going to say low. Now, the word low, 3808, just means not, right? It's a, it's a negative, right? It's just a negation. Okay, so it says not um, amad, to stand. So they shall not stand. And then it says am, the people, and it has uh, this... Vav in front of it. So it just says Vav. That's just saying and people choicest. Um, and then it says, uh, uh this word ayin, uh, as from a primitive root meaning to be nothing or to not exist. So will not exist generally used in a negative particle. So not exist. And then it has this word koach to be firm, right? So that's, um, you know, it can mean strength, right? And then, and finally, Ahmad again, to stand. So, um, so the idea here is the choicest people um, have no strength to stand, right? Um, so those are the, the choices. So as far as neither his cho chosen people, um, what they're doing is this word neither is is um, this word. Yeah. So I don't know if this is a good translation of King James here. You know, my estimation of this translation. Because it just says, like, the South shall not stand. So it's using that word not. Um, his people will not stand. They don't, they don't have strength to stand. Now, when we put it in, it says, neither his chosen people, neither shall there be any strength to stand. But we don't have the word, they shall not stand. So they're, they're using this, this word neither, which occurs once. They're using it in both phrases. I don't know if that makes sense to people, what I'm trying to do here in understanding this. I'm trying to follow you. Okay, so the idea is the arms of the south shall not stand, in the Negev, right? So All you've right. got the Zeroa, right, the arms. Okay, Zeroa. but is it, is it Negev or Negev? Negev. Well, Negev or Negev, it doesn't matter. The modern Hebrew you pronounces it as so I tend to use the modern pronunciation of So the Negev, right? The Negev, if you want to say it, what they think they used to, how they used to say it. And then you have this word not, low, right? So they shall not stand. And then it just says, um, so if we're going to really translate this literally, um, so go back here to the Hebrew. So it doesn't say they shall not stand. 
it's it's putting this word uh, here, this ayin, ayin, which means um, lots of different things. It means to be nothing or not exist, a non-entity, generally used as a name particle. Else, except, fail, less, be gone, um, neither, never, no, none, nor not, nothing, to not, pass. So is it saying that none of these, like, that all of these are going to fail? I don't know if that's what it's saying. So, um, so the question is what it's saying that the chosen people, the one that he's chosen, will not have strength and will not be able to stand. Is that what it's saying? Right? Because the arms of the South shall not stand. But then it goes to the chosen people. And the question is, are those the chosen people of the South? Or are they the chosen people of the North? You understand what I'm saying here? Yeah. Okay. The question I was just asking. Yeah. Um, so the chosen people, we only have the word neither there once. But it says, neither is chosen people, neither shall there be any strength to withstand. It could have sent, said, the South shall not withstand, nor the people that the king of the North has chosen, as they don't have strength to withstand. So they're not going to be able to stand. Now, when we have withstand, most of the time this word is going to be stand up, right? It's used right. all in chapter 11. So what it's saying to me is that the king of the north is not going to have strength to stand up. But he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will. This is the papacy. So even though we have this battle between these two ideologies, they are both weakened and a new power comes in. And that is the papacy. And the only way that they, and it says, and he shall stand in the glorious land, which by his hand shall be consumed. So can we see that verse 16 is referring to the papacy coming in, being set upon the throne of the world, bringing in the Sunday law? Now, the United States, Republicanism, apostate Protestantism, is making a league with Rome to do this, right? And the ideologies of apostate, or not apostate, atheistic communism, it's weakened to the point that it also falls to the papacy. Right? So the one that stands, if we take it this way, um, I know our time is up. So we will come back to this tomorrow. Right? Good. So try to keep your finger on this. Because I think this is, is an important point. Um, where we start to see how Rafi and Paneum lead to the Sunday law. Now, the United States, of course, is going to be this power that's going to bring this Sunday law to the world because it's going to be the armies of the papacy. But here in this context, both these ideologies end up bowing to this ideology that does according to his own will, to this power that does according to his own will. The papacy. And none shall stand before him, and he shall stand in the glorious land, which it, by his hand shall be consumed. Right? So that brings us to Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. It gives us that history. But it, it brings us from Greece to Rome coming in. And Rome has to come in at the Sunday law, the king of the north being this one ideology, which we would call apostate Protestantism, the false prophet. And then we have this other, ide other ideology, atheistic communism or the dragon power. And with the papacy, they form this threefold union. And that's when we have the Sunday law. So we'll come look at this tomorrow. OK, let's pray. A dear, gracious, heavenly father, thank you for the study today. 
I know, Lord, we've been struggling with these things, but we feel that you have been leading. We can see that uh, the truths that have been revealed in your word in the past, in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, are becoming clearer. And we just pray that individually we can study these things to see whether or not they are so. Be with us uh, throughout this day and bring us together again tomorrow morning according to thy will. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.